Hello, everybody. Um, my name is Christina. And before I get started, I just want to give you a little bit of background of um, what I do. <laughs> uh, so I've been a front-end developer for almost 10 years now. And every time I say that, I can't believe it's been that long. Um, and in the last three years or so, I've also been teaching web development as well. And currently, um, my main job is I'm the technical lead at Ladies Learning Code here in Toronto. So I get to do a little bit of both. I do some dev, I do some teaching, and I also have some side projects that I'm working on as well. I'm teaching at another community project uh, called TechSpark and just this stuff. So basically, I've had a lot of great opportunities over the years. I've worked at some great agencies and done a lot of projects on the side. Um, so as much as I love being in this industry, the one pain point for me has always been the lack of diversity, and this is kind of what we're all here to, to sort of talk about and think about as well. Um, and again, like I was saying, as much as I've enjoyed working in this industry, there's always been a little part of me that has felt a little bit excluded from the larger culture. And this ex exclusion also kind of changes how you see yourself within the culture. And it also affects who comes into the industry, who stays in the industry, who excels. And even on the business side, it affects what kind of products and services that we can create and offer. So because of all of these reasons, I think it's really important that we continue to have this discussion. So diversity has become a pretty hot topic that even me, who is an advocate for diversity, there are times where I kind of even like roll my eyes, like, yeah, let's talk about this again. Because a lot of times it just feels like talk. So the goal of today's talk is like, how can we make this more meaningful and go from just talking to actually doing? So let's uh, elevate it to medium talk at least. Uh, so why do I choose to talk about diversity? So I don't expect to become best friends with all my coworkers. I don't really believe in the idea that cultural fit means people you want to hang out with. I think cultural fit in the workplace means that you have the same goals, you work well together, you play off each other, that sort of thing. Um, and I haven't really experienced any overt discrimination at work per se, um, but it's often the microaggressions, little offhand comments, inappropriate jokes, they wear away with, at you um, over time. And it didn't happen right away. Uh, it was, again, just something that was small and just worked its way into sort of my, my psyche, I guess, over time. And I internalized it. I thought, you know, maybe I'm just ungrateful or maybe I'm expecting life to be perfect. Like, this is just how life goes. I should be happy that at least I am in an industry that I love and a lot of people can't say that they have that. Then I realized that if I just kept complaining to my friends who don't work in tech, then nothing was really going to change. So why do I choose to talk about diversity now? So number one is to increase awareness. Um, I'm sure everyone here is aware of these issues in our industry, but there are still other people who don't really know that this is actually a problem, especially in cities like Toronto, which are multi-ethnic, multicultural. We have so many kinds of people here. Everybody loves to say I have friends from all these different places that were lulled into the idea that this isn't a problem here because we're, we're already in a mixed group. Um, so I find that just talking about your experiences just helps other people to understand that there are things that are going on. And another reason I like, I've been trying to be more vocal about it is, is I want to just show a different representation of developers and people who work in tech. So even to this day, I still sort of get the, oh, you're you're a developer, you write code, they're kind of surprised that I do this, or that people say I don't look like a developer, I don't act like one, et cetera, and so forth. So um, I feel like even just being seen will help other people to see that there really is no one way to do this. And um, as I've been teaching more as well, I find that I'm also in a position to be able to speak for other people who are maybe new to the industry or they're just not comfortable with speaking out about these issues yet because they feel like they don't want to rock the boat, they don't want to seem like they're difficult. And I think I'm kind of at the point in my career where I don't really care as much anymore. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm okay with being a little bit more vocal about this now. So, 
However, sometimes I still feel like this. I have a little bit of a love-hate relationship with talking about diversity. On one hand, I love it for obvious reasons because I love connecting with other people and I love to let other people know that you know, they, they have support, we do feel the same way. Um, but sometimes, you know, I just don't feel like it. Why can't I just be a regular person? Why does my life have to be a teachable moment for you? So there are days where it's just, you know what? I'm just gonna put my headphones on, write some code, and leave it at that. <laughs> but if you are planning or already are thinking about trying to be more vocal about this topic, I don't wanna scare you away from talking about it, but it is a difficult conversation to have. There are going to be things that you are going to have to deal with, like constantly defending the validity and importance of talking about this and being aware of this. Um, I did another conference talk not too long ago, and I did a short interview with um, the organizers, and they posted it on YouTube. And the first and only comment to me just talking about how we need to expand the definition of diversity, et cetera, was I call bullshit, blah, blah, blah. And I'm just like, did you hear a word that I was saying? <laughs> so this is going to be a constant. You have to just sort of continually validate that this is important. And you're always going to hear the meritocracy argument. Why don't we just hire the best people? Well, there's many studies that have been shown that even something as simple as a name could determine whether you get a callback or not. So if your name sounds not white, basically, you already have a lower chance of getting a callback from potential employers. And often this is an unconscious bias as well. So it's something that we really have to work on to be conscious of, or maybe, maybe even finding uh, ways to find applicants without looking at specific um, details. Uh, personal details. Um, so the meritocracy argument is flawed because I'm sure we probably know maybe one or two people that we may have worked with in the past that probably weren't the top of their class, shall we say. <laughs> so the idea that we should hire um, the most qualified people sounds nice in theory, but it often is not how it works in the real world. And that the same thing goes with the pipeline argument. Sure, you can only hire from the group that is there, but there's lots of barriers to access to even get into the pipeline. Um, and many people leave, as we talked about, uh, heard about in our previous talk. So if people are not getting into the industry or they're leaving soon after, that also makes your applicant pool a little bit smaller. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. And defining what true diversity is. So it's not just about gender or just leaning towards, oh, we just want a good cultural fit. Um, I find that when we talk about diversity in tech, it often falls to women in tech. And even sometimes it even falls to white women in tech. So sometimes when I see you know, conferences or organizations being praised or boasting about, look at how great our diversity is, and then I look at the lineup or the about us pictures and I still see sort of like a wall of white faces. And it's great that there's women included in there. But if we want to talk about diversity, diversity really means including everybody. So there's the obvious sort of gender, um, ethnic, groups, the physical differences that we see, but even things like different personality types. Not everybody um, wants to drink beer and write code, for example. So we need to just expand the, di um, the definition of diversity as well and make sure that we are inclusive um, for everybody and not just our own group. Um, but on the other hand, of course, you can only really speak about the group that you belong to, but we want to just sort of keep in mind that uh, we want to make it inclusive for everybody as well. And finally, the last one that I've personally found uh, hard to do in the last two diversity talks that I did as, at conferences is trying not to offend or exclude or getting the attention of the majority group. So as much as we can sort of sit here together and find ways to come up with solutions, we also need the majority group to be part of this conversation as well because how can we change this on our own? So I'm always really careful when I talk about diversity that I don't attack any groups. So this isn't a, you know, white men are the problem and this is how it goes. It's about um, opening the definition, talking about solutions and such. But the last two um, conferences that I went to, the majority of the uh, attendees to my talk were women, people of color, and people who identify with being an under underrepresented group. So 
it's hard to try to let everyone know that this needs to be an inclusive conversation. So I've been playing around with the idea of maybe trying to pose it more of a business case to appeal to that sensibility because appealing to the moral sense is a little bit harder sometimes. Um, so if talking about diversity is hard, then how do we actually do something about it? Well, number one, talking about it is doing something about it. It's the first step. Um, the more I talk about it with other people, the more I realize that I'm actually not alone in how I feel. I spent um, a lot of my early career sort of just keeping this stuff to myself, keeping my head down, just doing the work, and feeling that I'm probably the only one who feels like this, I'm making a big deal out of nothing. But the more I talk about it, I realize that that's not true at all. And not only that, not only are there people who also feel the same way as I do, there are people who didn't know I felt this way and are open to, to hearing about these issues. So some people might not know that the problem exists if you don't tell them. So aside from talking, what else can we do? Something that is really important, I think, that is, is when we talk about diversity, often it's sort of the idea that we're, I don't know, going against this external force. But sometimes we need to also examine our own behaviors and our own potential biases. So being aware of your own behavior also takes a lot of conscious effort. So sometimes when you're part of an underrepresented group, it's easy to forget that we can still exhibit exclusionary behaviors towards other groups as well. Um, for example, I was told by uh, another woman actually that my personality probably wasn't strong enough to be a leader. So, yeah, to hear that from another woman who, you know, sort of purports to support women in tech was especially uh, unexpected, shall we say. And I think that uh, if we can't support each other, how do we sort of move forward in this movement? So I think even just watching our own behaviors, the things that we tell each other as well, and make sure that we always support each other. And also be mindful of how you present your opinions and your feedback. And this is something I've noticed a lot more as I started teaching. So especially if you're in a position of some kind of authority, maybe you're uh, some sort of like manager or you're a teacher, um, my students sort of look up to me as being the expert on things, little do they know. <laughs> so um, aside from just sort of teaching them the ins and outs of code, when I talk about more of the cultural aspects of the, the industry, or just really the soft skills that are required. I'm really careful to make sure I present my opinions as opinions and that these are just options and they really need to just find uh, what works for them. So a story that I always remember is um, I had a student that was uh, uncomfortable with putting her phone number on her website. And so I told her, well, then take it off. <laughs> and she told me that another instructor had told her to do it because it would help her get business. So despite the fact that she was uh, uncomfortable with this because she was told by someone that she respected that it was a good idea, she did it anyways. So on the outside, it might seem like such a small thing. But to me, it also sort of opened my eyes to how uh, careful we have to be as the experts or sort of the people of authority on how we um, help people who are coming into the industry as well. And um, back to the idea of being inclusive of everyone's experiences. So again, I can really only speak to the experience of being a woman and a person of color and specifically um, an Asian woman as well. Um, different groups, um, are discriminated in different ways. I was talking to uh, a former student who's also Asian as well, and I was talking to him about the lack of diversity in tech. And his response was, what are you talking about? We're totally killing it. Because for him, he couldn't see beyond our experience. And I said, well, I mean, there's a lot of more Asians in the industry, but for blacks and Hispanics, it's one in 2%, which is really dismal. So um, for him, I'm sure he meant no malice by that, but <laughs> um, being able to sort of see beyond your own experiences and see that we're kind of all in this together. Um, so the next one is really hard, at least it is for me, because I'm generally not a confrontational person, is trying to speak up for yourself or for others. I am queen of the snappy comebacks three hours later. <laughs> I'm on the bus, I'm like, oh, I should have said this. <laughs> um, so, 
what I try to do instead is I save that snappy comeback in a little repository because unfortunately, I know this will probably come up again and maybe next time I'll be ready for it. <laughs> so, or even speaking up for somebody else, if you notice that somebody's trying to speak and somebody else keeps interrupting them, you can just say, oh wait, I think um, so-and-so hasn't finished um, her thought yet. So something as small as that, I'm sure would be really appreciated by another person as well. And just keep your repository of snappy comebacks for next time. And the third one, it seems so simple, just be yourself. Right? Um, I always talk about code switching as well. So code switching is a fairly normal thing that a lot of us do. Basically, we just behave differently with different people because of our relationships with them. So you're going to be one way with your friends, you're going to be one way with your parents, and that's totally normal. Um, but if you get to a point where sometimes you might be on a permanent code switch because you're just trying to sort of fit in, or maybe you just want to downplay your differences, it can be a little bit hard to sort of feel like you have to keep a piece of yourself at home all the time. So I've been more cognizant of trying to be myself um, when I'm teaching, when I'm in the workplace, and sometimes, again, they're just small things, um, like just saying, you know what, I don't know what movie you're talking about. Actually, uh, I don't like doing X instead of just trying to sort of play along just to, to be like everybody else. Um, the more you are yourself, then other people will see that there are different representations and maybe they will also start to like some of the things you like. Okay, so how not to get derailed. So I'm not gonna lie, I get disillusioned sometimes. Yeah, <laughs> more than I'd like to admit. Um, after doing two conference talks on diversity, I started to question um, if I should even bother doing this. Um, a part of me thought, oh, I should have just done a technical talk because that's what Twitter likes and maybe it would help my professional career and that's what everybody seems to get excited about and my talk could barely fill half a room. Uh, so it was a little bit, um, I felt a little bit, I guess, sad that uh, just talking to a bunch of empty seats and here I was telling a personal story about my struggles and these stats and, and whatnot. But um, after talking with the, the uh, participants that did come and hearing them share their own stories and just, just being thankful that there are someone out there speaking for them as well, then I realized, you know, there's lots of people doing technical talks. Sure, maybe I'll do one here or there, but this is also important as well, and it's also important to me. So I need to find ways to not get derailed and keep doing what is important to me. Um, so I need to focus on the goal and just filter out the noise. So doing events like this is great because this is what we're all here for, right? Um, and very important, self-care. Don't read the comments. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Don't do it. <laughs> Although I still do it. <laughs> but you know, you have to make sure to take care of yourself first and you have to be really realistic about what you can handle. So if you need to just step away, not talk about it, again, your life does not have to be uh, a learning experience for someone else. They can pick up a book every now and again or read a blog post or something. So make sure you take care of yourself when it just gets to be too much. And have your friends around as your, your um, to kind of help you out. And also, another thing I want to point out is don't be afraid to be critical. Back to the idea that um, diversity has become a very hot topic that I've also noticed that it seems that it's started to attract a lot of bandwagon supporters, people who sort of just publicly say that they support it, but their private actions are a little bit different. So don't be afraid to be critical and ask questions and um, demand to see results. If they say they're doing this, well, let's see your results. You want to make sure that you spend your time and energy focusing and supporting people who are actually doing the work that you care about as well. And every little bit helps. So whether it's just retweeting an article or just saying thanks to somebody, um, I think all of this stuff will help to keep you focused, keep me focused, keep all of us um, with our eyes on the prize, shall we say. And I just have a couple extra resources. So there was this talk from another AlterConf 
actually um, talking the talk, and she really goes into more details of um, how to have more meaningful conversations. And this article is also a great article that um, talks about the pipeline myth. And I threw in my last video from my last diversity talk because why not? <laughs> so um, that's pretty much all I have for you. I think I have a couple minutes if anybody has any questions. So the question was, if you see someone who you can tell is enjoying themselves in the STEM field, but they're feeling derailed, so I'm guessing you mean like maybe feelings of wanting to leave, right? So how, how would I support them or how would I help them, right? Okay, so uh, I actually do see that a lot um, when I'm teaching. So um, what I usually do is I just kind of talk to them one-on-one, -on -one and I, I tell them that, you know, no matter what... Um, job they go to, this is something that is not exclusive to tech, unfortunately. This is just kind of the world that we live in. That when you're in a minority, things can be a little bit harder. So I just tell them that they might as well do the job that they love, because either way, this is something that we kind of just have to deal with. And um, I, that's another thing that I actually really like about teaching and why I continue to do because I find that those people who do feel that way, they've kind of gravitated towards me. So I think just having someone who's around to be able to um, be sympathetic to um, these feelings and just having someone there to just say, it'll be okay. <laughs> okay, so the question was, um, if I've ever encountered or how, how I would deal with someone who um, left the industry because they felt really marginalized um, and just couldn't deal with it. I actually haven't. Um, I've, I've only gotten to the point where they've thought about it. <laughs> um, and I think, I guess then that I, the best thing I would say is to try to find communities like this so that we can have each other to just say, let's keep doing this. Because if, again, the idea is if you leave the industry, leave it and do what? I mean, I've thought about leaving as well. Just some days I'm like, ah, I'm tired of this. <laughs> but then I think, leave and do what? <laughs> so um, I think it just kind of goes back to um, finding a community that will support you even if it's just one person. Um, I have worked in an environment where, though everyone was nice, there was sort of the I don't really fit in. So when I found that one friend, <laughs> it helped me to just sort of keep my eyes on the prize, shall we say. So just make sure you just find a community, even if it's just one or two people, okay? Or you could be that person for that other person who might be trying to leave. <laughs> Anybody else? Uh, Maybe one more minute. Okay. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you.